Ladies and gentlemen, Martin, a pleasure as usual. I have been asked to discuss with you today public procurement and tendering process in construction. Construction projects are bespoke, they are always unique, and more often than not, they are risky and extremely expensive undertakings. As Mr. Justice Kern of the Australian Court of Appeal reminds us, except in the middle of a battlefield, nowhere must men coordinate the movement of other men and material in the midst of such chaos and with such limited certainty of the present facts and the future occurrences as in a huge construction project. And he continues, even the most painstakingly planning frequently turns out to be a mere conjecture and accommodation to changes must necessarily be rough, quick and ad hoc sort analogous to the ever-changing commands on the battlefields. So construction is like a battlefield, ladies and gentlemen. There are risks. The same with tendering. Tendering is also similar to the space shuttle launch trajectory. We start with, what you can see on the screen, the dual rocket boosters. Then we continue the, tra the traject with the external tank. And totally at the end is the space shuttle. It is only the space shuttle that will reach its mission. And the same applies to tender documents, ladies and gentlemen. The two external rockets, they are the contract notice. Then we keep going with the external tank, which is really your tender documents. And at the end, all we have is the contract. The four corners of the contract. We do not remember what was in the tender documents. We do not remember what was in the contract notice. We only have the contract. And the contract will consist of three things. The terms and conditions, the price you will have tendered for, and the scope of the works that have to be carried out. And it will all have to be in that contract. And it amazes me, it absolutely amazes me, that contracting authorities still now go out to tender have tender documents, have done all of that, yet they forget, they forget the um, contract, tender contract that have to be attached. Now, it is risky. It is a very risky undertaking, even though people might say it's a little bit of a routine. And that's what we also said when we uh, had the launch of the Space Shuttle Challenger. Some of you might remember, some of you that have my age will remember because we were watching it on the news, the unfolding of the disaster, the disaster of the explosion of the subtle, the Space Shuttle Challenger. Well, ladies and gentlemen, tendering is like that as well. Do not consider for five minutes that tendering is standard, that tendering is something that you will have no problems with. No. Litigation is there. If you make one faux pas, you will be litigated, especially in Ireland. And you cannot hide, as a contracting authority, behind the fact that you have used standard documents. The person that will be in the witness box will be you, not the Department of Finance that tells you to use those documents. So the big problem, and that is really what I'm going to emphasize here all along, is I have no problem with standard documents. I think standard documents are helpful, but we need flexibility. And if you eliminate flexibility, we're going to go through a problematic tender phase. Now, what 
is public procurement? Well, public procurement are the rules that apply when a public body or an entity that uses 10% of public money acquire works, construction works, goods, material for construction works, or services, for example, the architect, the engineer, the consultant, the assigned certifier, all of them appointed with public money. Those are the rules. Which rules? Well, we have the various directives, and depending on the directive that is applicable on you, then the rules in that directive will apply, and all those directives have been implemented into Irish law. So they are Irish law, even though we will refer to it as European law, but they have been incorporated into Irish law. The rule is we first see if it's a utility, and utility is what they call wet, which is water, energy, transport, telecommunication and post, if you're one of those contracting authority, you fall under the utilities directive and there are certain advantages there for you. There's a special concession agreement. If you are in the military, well then you have a special rule that applies for you due to the confidentiality. But if you don't fall in any of those, then you fall under the classic directive. Okay? Attached to that is the remedies directive. And the Remedies Directive, it does exactly what it says. It deals with the remedies. If you do it wrong, what happens then? There are also pure Irish rules. In the past, they were referred to as the Green Book. Now it's called the NPPPF, which is the National Pro Public Procurement Policy Framework, which will set out certain rules, and since we're dealing with construction, you have the Capital Works Management Framework, which contains specific uh, templates for an SAQ, what I would call a PQQ, pre-qualification questionnaire. We thought it was good to change it to an SAQ. It has a standard um, ITT or RFT, which is effectively your instruction to tenders. You then have various contracts, depending if it will be design built or whether it will be the traditional builds. So they are all there and we welcome the design built contracts uh, in the suite. And then you have all types of letters that you have to sign. For example, the Dear John letter, you've been unsuccessful or the successful letters. They're all in that document. From that point of view, very useful document because if you don't know where to start, there they are. The problem is you can't amend it. You can't amend anything. Because if you want to amend, you need to have a derogation to do so. Very hard to get. In practice, people do amend it. And I would advise people to amend it. Why? Because I believe that if you use those documents as they are, you are breaching some fundamental principle of uh, procurement law, the one which is transparency. But we'll come back to that. If we go to the thresholds that are applicable, because it's the thresholds, the estimated value of the project that will decide whether you fall under the European rules as implemented in Ireland or thereunder, which they call the sub-thresholds agreements. EU rules, it so the threshold changes every two years, last year and this year for works and related services to those works. So if an architect is appointed to do works for a specific project, it is added to the value of 5.382 uh, million. If it's purely a service which is not relating to a work and goods not relating to a project, then it's 250,000. Okay? If we fall under that, we are looking at if it's over 50,000, up to the threshold of 5 million, etc., you have to go to e tender. If it's under 50,000 and there is a cap in below, and I'll come back to that, you have to write an invitation to minimum five uh, tenderers. But can I draw your attention to the wording of the NPPPF? It actually says you have to go to minimum five interested and competent contractors. So that does not mean, ladies and gentlemen, one 
candidate and four pre-advised candidates not to tender. That would be distorting the competition, ladies and gentlemen. So don't listen to those false prophets uh, that are telling you that, ah, oh, it'll be fine, we'll just go to John, we'll give him the job, and then we will go to Mary, Peter, Joseph and Anthony, and they will say no. You cannot do that. It has to be interested and competent contractors. That's what the NPPPF tells us we have to do. If it's under the, if, if it is in between 25 to 50, uh, you still have to go to tenders if, uh, for general services. If it's under the 25, you have to have minimum three tenderers and again, interested and competent uh, contractors and if it's under the five you only have to go to one or more my advice ladies and gentlemen don't take any risks and always go uh, to europe and then you do nothing wrong it's up to you there are exclusions and i've only mentioned two there is a few exclusions in the rules but one that came recently was arbitration arbitration is excluded un under the eu rules I recently had a case where I had to refer the matter to conciliation, which is an ADR procedure, and the contracting authority told me they couldn't do so because they had to go to public procurement of this conciliator. That is not true, that is excluded and has nothing to do with this and it's only a tactic to delay matters. It's excluded. Land transaction and lease transactions are excluded but here we have a bit of a, a difficulty, which was, but what about land development? People were trying to be very inventive and say, tell you what, I will buy, I as contracting authority will buy your land, but I want you to build something on it and then I'll buy it. That's what I call a land development agreement. Well, when Oru and Rouen case came, French matter for a leisure centre, it rocked us all because the European Court of Justice says absolutely not. If you have a land development agreement, you need to go back to Europe. Then we had the Helmut Müller case and the court and said, the European Court of Justice said the rules apply when there is a direct economic benefit for the contracting authority and when the definition of the works that are required goes further than planning uh, permission requirements. If it's, you specify more, then you go to Europe. And then we have recently, the recently 2019, the European Commission versus the Republic of Austria, where the contracting authority called Wien Wiener Wohnen uh, went out and wanted to lease a building, but wanted to make amendments to the building. And the European Court of Justice did not follow the Advocate General in that uh, regard. And they said, no, factually, factually, the stipulation in that case did not exceed what a tenant may normally require. And if you fall under that category, you do not have to go to Europe. OK, so those are the exclusions that I wanted to pick out for construction. Fundamental in public procurement rules are the fundamental principles of public procurement. What are they? Transparency. That's why I don't like the Capital uh, Works Frameworks Agreement. It's not transparent. It has to be crystal clear what you want and why you want and what you're going to do with the information. Transparency. First rule. Second rule, equality. We need to treat all the tenders in the same way. No discrimination. Lastly, proportionality. Whatever you ask must be proportionate to the last point on the slides, the subject matter of the competition. So the subject matter of the competition, ladies and gentlemen, is the most important part when you go out to tender and you need to put time in to be very clear as to what that is. If you have a children's hospital, what do you mean by a children's hospital? How far does it go? It takes time, but it's well-deserving if you do it correctly. 
and all your selection and award criteria cannot confer an unrestricted freedom to the contracting authority. You cannot say, for example, uh, the person that understands my needs best will get this contract, because doing so, ladies and gentlemen, gives an unrestricted freedom, or confers an unrestricted freedom to the contracting authority. Not possible. I like to put your attention to Article 24, which is a new article, and it's really starting to have its effect also now in Ireland, very big in the UK, uh, uh, the article of no conflict of interest. A contracting authority shall take appropriate measures to effectively prevent, identify and remedy conflict of interests arising in the conduct of the procurement procedure, to avoid distortion of competition and to ensure equal, uh, equal treatment. And any person that is helping you in that regard falls under that uh, conflict of interest obligation. And you have to, as you know under the fear index in our Article 84.2, you must specify in the decisions you have made the conflict of interest you have, you have uh, uh, identified and the remedies you have dealt with it. All of that needs to be stated. So you might say, yes, but that doesn't apply for the sub-thresholds under the 25. Uh, uh, euro a rule because we are then in sub-threshold but that's where I'd like to introduce to you the Dracula effect that you have in public procurement. The Dracula effect is this when before Dracula came uh, in our uh, existence we had people were dead or they were alive and when Dracula came we had the living death, which was a new thing that came in there. Well, we have that also in European law, because before it was whatever was under the directive as implemented stayed under the sub thresholds, or it means the higher thresholds that I specified, not the sub thresholds, the lower thresholds. Okay, so that was the case. Um, but with Telostria, they said, well, do you know those general principles that I highlighted to you? Those general principles are also in the European Treaty. And the European Treaty is applicable on you. And you don't have to go too far that the conflict of interest will filter through, through this Dracula effect. Any procurement, we start with a notice. We then might have uh, separate mm, the pre-qualification where we can assess whether the candidate, not what he is proposing or she is proposing, what the candidate is, has as experience in the area and whether they have the financial strength to carry the project through. So we can do that in a restricted or a negotiated procedure if we apply for it a two-step procedure or we bang it together in an open procedure and we then have the ITT and the RFT where we have the award criteria whereby we are going to see whether the person can do the job or sorry whether what what proposal the tenderer has to do the job and how much it's gonna cost so that's where we have the the third phase on the slice then we have the contract the space shuttle that will arrive and will have to be executed and we have the after execution which is very often forgotten people think once the contract is signed no more public procurement we don't care about it let's move on not the case at all because we had the pre-text case and the pre-text case says if you make a change to a material change to the terms and conditions the price and the scope you have to go back to Europe unless you fall under the Article 72 exemptions. For example, you might have specified that in your contract because you had thought it through. You, you had put a uh, change provision in there. But if you fall outside the change or variation clause, you have to go back to Europe. And the change is very simple. 
if you ask for a performance bond in the beginning and then at the end you drop the requirement, that's a change back to Europe. If you amend the scope so fundamentally that it could not have been foreseen, back to Europe. Okay, so there's an awful lot. Uh, even the change at the time from uh, the uh, Deutsche Mark to an EU to a Euro, Euro we, we now only know our Euro, but this was in the time that was considered a material change. These are the steps you have to go through. It starts with the beginning where you have your notice, where you have your subject matter of the contract, and then you have the execution afterwards. Now, a tender, not to forget for those people that are tendering, is a presentation tailored towards the subject matter of the competition and the scoring matrix. You need to understand what the scoring matrix is. Do not assume. Ask tender queries. For example, who is in the evaluation team? I would like to know who is going to assess me and what qualification that person has. You are entitled to ask the question. If you are not given the question, if they don't want to answer that question, it might have an effect down the line. I have a case where someone was supposed, supposed to assess uh, boats and effectively, it turns out that the assessors were music teachers. Now, is that allowed? Yes, it is allowed. But they can make a material evaluation error. And I, if I had known that, I might have tendered my job in a different way. I might have explained it better what my uh, tender was. So it is not bad for the contracting authorities to say who is in the evaluation team. In fact, it is advisable that they do so. Not only can these evaluators assist in the shaping up of uh, the tender documents so that people know what will be assessed and what is important for the contract. Not only there, but it's also important for the tender that is, the tenderer that is tendering for the job. Now, sometimes there might be a conflict in between what is required under the contract and what is required under the scope. So there might be conflict. So you, as a tenderer, you are the specialist. You should ask the questions. Don't say you're going to upset the uh, contracting authority. Uh, you, it, it is in your best interest to actually make sure that the contracting authority has addressed all the questions you as an expert know. Okay? Because at the end, the court will look at what a reasonably well-informed and normally diligent tenderer is going to consider the scoring matrix to be. So if you have asked tender queries, that will shape that uh, reasonably well-informed and normally well and um, normally diligent uh, tenderer's view. So I would strongly advise you to do um, the, uh, it would be too simple not to uh, do and uh, you will not score. Uh, if information is asked which you doubt they can do something with it, well then you should mention the fact that the contracting authority is not allowed to ask information. They will do nothing with. They can only ask information, they will assess. The, um, what we do know now is that you cannot, once the, the, the contracting authority has decided who the most economically advantageous tender is, they cannot enter into a contract. There's a period of 14 days that have to be respected. And if that is not respected, there's a big sanction where the court can simply uh, make that contract non-effective. Okay, so 14 days and uh, the, uh, per the period for challenging is 30 days. And that start with when the 14 days uh, start. And that start also once the contracting authorities have given the reasons. What are the reasons? And the reasons is not just the scores. As we know, Mr. Justice Humphrey specified it very clear in the RPS uh, Consulting Engineering uh, versus uh, Kildare County Council. We cannot give those boilerplate type of information whereby we say, well, you were not too bad, but the winning tenderer was better. Whilst you can compare, you have to say why. 
why the winning tenderer was better. An explanation has to be given. It has to be very clear for the tenderers why they lost. And perhaps it becomes clear that the contracting authority has introduced a criteria that was not published. That is not allowed. And then we have an evaluation error. So those things placed together, 30 days is a guillotine. If you do not act within the 30 days, then uh, you cannot tender any more. What is new? Green public procurement is a new uh, requirement. We have the circular 2020-19, not so very well drafted, that says you should use a green procurement, but the EPA green public procurement guidance for the public sector, very well written, tells us that we must use public procurement in 2023, that is now, um, and uh, the, this is a requirement, and they gave quite clear indications at w as what could be construction uh, procurement, especially in the performance of the building. One point there, if you go to the Commission's website, you will see a framework called Levels. I would advise you to go there as a contracting authority because it provides a common language for the sustainability performance of buildings. A common language and they have broken that down in six macro objectives. So it's good to use the same language when you are developing your green award criteria when it deals with the performance of the building. My question was in the beginning, are the public procurement rules fit for purpose? Absolutely. The public procurement rules from Europe as implemented are perfect. They tell you what to do, they allow you to do green procurement, they are really good. The Capital Works Framework Agreement is not bad as a standard document. If it was just a guideline, it is not good and it actually is absolutely not good in public procurement and explosions will happen like the explosion we had uh, when we looked at the TV and we saw the space shuttle explosion. Uh, litigation will happen if we do not introduce the flexibility in public procurement and flexibility would mean that the Capital Works Management Framework Agreement would become a guideline. But, ladies and gentlemen, I'm like Don Quixote. I'm fighting the windmills. As it stands, the Capital Works Management Framework Agreement must be agreed, otherwise you will not get the finance from the Department of Finance. But if you want to avoid public procurement challenges, you know what you have to do. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you.